Hello! On today's episode, I take a visit to one of Cornwall's most active nature reserves. I stayed a little bit closer to home and delved deep into the undergrowth to find one of my favourite detritivores. And I went on the track of one of Britain's favourite mammals that's made a comeback in Cornwall. All this on our latest episode of Nature, nature Watch! I'll be the first to admit it, when winter comes around and the skies start turning grey, it can be tempting to stay tucked up inside to shelter from the elements. However, as we say on Nature Watch, Cornwall is a fantastic place for one to get in touch with wildlife and winter makes no exception. In fact, for bird enthusiasts, winter is considered one of the best times of year to observe wildlife. So today, I've got my wellies on, some binoculars to hand, and I'm taking a visit to the Hale Estuary. The Hale Estuary is the perfect place for birds and bird lovers alike. So perfect in fact that since 1993 it's been a designated and protected triple SI, or site of special scientific interest. It's a dynamic tidal ecosystem which provides a suite of habitat types and can accommodate shorebirds, waders and waterfowl all at the same time. One of the reasons estuaries such as this are particularly popular with birds is because they provide a great amount of food. Deep channels keep water flowing through the estuary and provide the ecosystem with nutrients from further upstream. These nutrients, as well as the sand and sediment that's deposited on tidal flats, support thriving invertebrate communities. And these invertebrates, animals such as worms, crustaceans and mollusks, are the food supply for some wading birds, for example curlews. And because Hale Estuary never freezes over, it effectively acts as a year-round food conveyor belt for some especially exciting species. On occasion, one might even spot the magnificent spoonbill swinging their highly sensitive bill through the shallows. Though a frequent summer visitor, the spoonbill is a rarity in the winter months. Even these exceptional waders recycle nutrients back into the estuary. Kingfishers perch above the water, patiently waiting for their opportunity. As well as fish, shrimp are often on the menu at Hale. As well as sighting a plethora of species, visiting sites abundant in wildlife is a perfect opportunity to meet other wildlife enthusiasts and to exchange stories and knowledge. With this this, this has been formed probably about 20 years now, this Ryan's Field. And so it's enabled um, birds to, to spill over from the main estuary here into um, this little lagoon. Yeah. Um, and so here just now we saw a little egret fly across. Um, and certainly when I was growing up, the little egret was no more than a, a plate in a book. It yeah. was um, one of those beautiful birds. You think there's no way in the world I'm ever going to see one of those and eventually you get one turn up somewhere in, in Cornwall and you race off and twitch it uh, where today of course they're here we don't really give them a second glance they've now become very very common yeah. and breeding on the on the Helford. Well what a successful day it's been I've been blessed with a wide array of species and it's been a pleasure to talk to some fellow wildlife enthusiasts. Unfortunately, I'm running low on daylight hours now, but I'm so glad I took the opportunity to come and visit such a wonderful habitat. Wow, Hale is such a hot spot for wildlife. I'll definitely be exploring there myself. Absolutely, it's such a great way to spend the day and I was so pleased to meet some local wildlife enthusiasts who could share with me their own knowledge. 
It looked like the waders were quite happily munching away at invertebrates there in the mud. And it's important not to overlook these little creatures, as they're just as fascinating as those higher up the food chain. I'm here on campus to find out a little bit more about a particularly nostalgic crustacean. If you're an outdoorsy kid, you no doubt found these funky little critters living in rotting wood piles in your garden. Yes, I'm talking about the woodlouse, and today I'm going to try and find some. The best place to look for woodlice is under the bark of fallen logs, where they can be found living in groups. However, it's important not to disturb them too much, and always put them back where you found them. Woodlice are detritivores, which means they eat dead and decaying matter found in the forest. They belong to the same phylum as crabs and lobsters, which are mostly aquatic. The sturdy woodlouse, however, has managed to conquer the land. Although this has come at a cost, and a woodlouse must remain in moist, humid environments if they are to be able to breathe. Here are three fun woodlice facts. Fact number one. Did you know woodlice are a little bit like kangaroos? The females have a marsupium in which they keep the fertilised eggs, and when they hatch, the mothers look after the babies. Fact number two. Woodlice are coprophagous, which means they sometimes eat their own faeces. They also don't urinate and instead excrete ammonia through their skin. Zoology sometimes makes you very pleased you're human. Fact number three. Did you know woodlice can come in many different colours? In the UK, we have 45 different species of woodlice, ranging from the usual grey to brown, gold and even pink. In some other countries, they even have blue woodlice. One important thing about woodlice is, of course, their names. Around the UK, there's many regional variations on what people call these creatures. We've decided to walk around campus and ask people what they think they're called. Whereabouts are you from? Suffolk, East Anglia. Cool. And what did you call these? Well, either was it monkey peas or ground cows. Awesome. Monkey peas and ground cows. Cool. Um, whereabouts are you from? I'm from Western Supermare in the West Country. Fantastic. And what did you call these as a kid? Rollies. Fantastic, thank you. So, uh, do you have a specific name for, for these creatures? We used to call them cheesy bugs at home. Okay. Where's home? Uh, Hampshire. 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 Cool, whereabouts are you from? Gloucester. And what do you call these? Um, well, I have heard them being called granny grashers. Granny grashers! Strange. Where are you both from? I'm from Paul in Dorset. Somerset. Okay, and what do you call these? A pill bug. Chuggy pig. Chuggy pig, nice. And pill bug. Awesome. Cool. So, what do you call these creatures? Oh, that's a doodle bug. Uh, whereabouts are you from? Uh, I'm from the Midlands. Awesome. Midlands. Woodlice are a part of many people's childhood, and accessible wildlife like this can be a kid's first step into exploring nature. They might be small and sometimes overlooked, but we at Nature Watch think woodlice are just great. Good work, guys. I must say, Maisie, I'll no longer be overlooking roly polies, ground cows, cheesy bugs, or whatever we're deciding to call them. I should hope not. Woodlice are awesome, and they're so important in introducing young kids to the world of wildlife with all their funky names. So as we've seen, all creatures from big to small are really important, but what's also important is looking after the habitat they live in. As I found out when I went to go see what happens when a habitat is restored and the creatures that can return. I'm here today at Lowpool, Cornwall's largest natural lake. Lowpool is home to some amazing wildlife, like potchers with their distinctive red heads. Lowpool is looked after by Lowpool Forum an amazing network of organisations such as the National Trust, the Environment Agency, RNAS Coldrose, South West Water, Natural England, Cornwall Wildlife Trust and the University of Exeter. Today we're going to tell you the story of this special site through a special animal, the otter. The history of otters at Lowpool mirrors that of otters throughout the UK. Pesticides such as DDT caused huge declines in otter numbers nationally in the 60s and 70s, and it seemed as though otters had gone extinct. Mm -hmm. 
Low pool was also suffering from something known as eutrophication. This means that the nutrient levels in the water are too high and can result in algal blooms covering the lake. This also means that there is less oxygen in the water, making it less of a good home for the wildlife that relies on it. In order to combat flooding, channels that lead into low pool were also straightened. However, this meant that there were lower levels of water in the pool itself. Visiting low pool today, you can see the results of a real conservation success story. Nationally, pesticides such as DDT have been banned, the pool itself has been rewetted, and the Forum have made massive strides in treating the eutrophication, and there have been no algal blooms since 2006. And the otters have returned. Take a look at this footage. Now otters are very elusive mammals, so you can never quite guarantee a sighting. However, you can put on your detective hat and look for signs. One way you can know if otters are using a site is if you can find some of their droppings. And here we have some that we found earlier. Now otter spray contains little bits of fish bones and mammal bones, basically bits of otters meals that they couldn't really digest. Now there's also a debate going on about what otter spray smells like. Some people say it smells fishy, other people say it smells like jasmine too. It's been a brilliant day visiting Low Pool, a place that really shows what community and working together can achieve in the name of conservation. <laughs>